Hi, this is Ashio, and welcome back to Sable's Grimoire. And I'm just having a look at the route map for this game. There are lots of different endings and routes that we can take. And we're still on the very first bit of the game. We haven't made any major decisions that's going to lead us down a different path. It's still the very early stages of the game. And I'm kind of surprised that we've gone so far. And we're still so early along. So, yeah, let's get to it. So, here we go. Granted a mere 15 minute break, I made my way to the Academy Library. It's a place I've visited many times through Senscapes. Filled with yet to be digitised books, the library contains knowledge found nowhere else in the world. Ancient tomes, stone tablets dating back thousands of years, spell books from a time when witches reigned supreme, even the occasional cursed or enchanted book. Visiting such a place for real for the first time, I felt a shiver round down my spine. The legendary Amadronia Academy Library, at long last, I'm able to come here in person. Although, Senscapes are desirable when wishing to experience certain things, or to view in particular places, Senscapes of a library are simply aggravating. Physical books yet to be digitised all around you, and yet you cannot reach out and grab them, nor can you view the contents from their non-existent digital equivalents. It's like staring at a picture of food when you're starving. It will do you no good, and the act amounts to nothing more than self-torture. There are so many books in here I've been wanting to read, and now that I have access to the library, my studies are going to accelerate right crazy. I might not have time right now, but after classes are over for today, I'm definitely coming back. Resisting the urge to open my terminal and read through the long list of books I've been wanting to check out, I instead walk over to the counter. On the wall are the rules of the library, as well as the conditions which must be met in order to borrow a book. It appears that students are expected to register for a library card and use that to identify themselves, and once they're able to use terminal, their terminal ID can be used instead. Okay, I'm so glad I invested my time into learning such a useful spell. Who needs physical identification when you have a terminal? Briefly patting myself on the back, I soon notice something odd on the other side of the counter. I can hear pages being torn, like the beast-like sound of something being devoured. What the hell? Did a magic beast get in the library? Magic beasts? Ordinarily animals warped by prolonged exposure to high density ether rarely seek out locations such as this. Most banjit beasts don't possess the intelligence to read or to understand human language, so libraries offer them nothing of substance. Only highly intelligent and similarly dangerous beasts would bother to come here. What should I do? I can't allow the books in here to be devoured, but I don't have the strength to fight a high level magic beast either. Is there anything I can do? Okay. Grab its attention, act as bait, or inspect. Um, act as bait, wow. Um, let's, let's have a look. Right, I need more information before I can come to an educated conclusion. If I don't at least figure out what manner of beast it is, how can I possibly figure out the best way to deal with it? I carefully lean over the counter, inching closer and closer. And gradually, black fur enters my field of vision, followed by metal skin. I move closer still, and by the time I realise that I've overstepped, a pair of crimson eyes are staring back at me. Oh shit. Who's this? It's the librarian. I jump back in fright, and to my surprise, so does the beast. Its crimson irises are not filled with rage, but with fear. Oh, it's just a first year. Oh, he really scared me. Oh yeah, likewise. I breathe a sigh of relief, as I finally see the beast for what it really is. A student, a female student, who's a year or two older than me. Not a threat, just another peculiar encounter. Oh, I'm sorry. I heard pages being torn from behind the counter, so I thought that a magic beast had gotten into the library. A magic beast? Oh dear, I certainly hope not. The last time a magic beast found its way in here, we lost a significant portion of the true crime section. This academy's library has a true crime bit. Smiling wryly, I bow my head. Um, at any rate, I'm sorry for startling you. Oh, not at all. If anything, I'm thankful for your attentiveness. If you do see a magic beast, please do not hesitate to take action. Oh, okay, sure. I scratch my head as I try to make sense of the young woman standing in front of me. Leaving aside her personality for the moment, there's still one question I must ask before anything else. So if there's no magic beast, then the one tearing up the books was you? Oh. The girl opens her eyes wide, as if she's only just realised that she was caught in the act. No, I mean, that is what... I mean, I was tearing pages out of a book, but it's, it's not what you think. I raise an eyebrow at the girl's failed explanation. So you were destroying a book. Yeah, I mean, no, but I was, but there's a good reason, really. Beginning to panic, the girl raises her voice. I was tearing pages out of the book, but only because I was asked to. You were asked to destroy Academy property? 
Who said that? Um, my boss, the principal. My gaze grows dull and I slacken my jaw, staring at the girl in front of me in utter disbelief. Don't look at me like that, it's true. My job is to digitise the books in the library and to destroy the books themselves after I'm done. Finally, something that makes sense. You're in charge of digitising the books, but aren't you a student? In response to my question, the girl stares at me quizzically. After a few moments, her eyes widen as though she just realised something. Oh, I see. You must have just enrolled here. Yeah, today's my first day. Oh, of course. It's that time of year already, isn't it? I suppose that would make me a third year bow. Suddenly, talking in a much brighter tone, the girl happily continues to speak. Your teachers will tell you about this in your second year at the academy, but there are actually many jobs you can apply for while studying here. Students work odd jobs around the academy in order to make a little bit of extra money. It's mostly seen as a way for low-ranking students to raise their allowance. Oh, but don't get the wrong idea. I'm most certainly not a low-ranking student. I have my own reasons for doing this, I assure you. Ignoring the girl's final statement, I open my terminal and begin to search for job listings inside the academy. After performing a few searches, however, I'm still yet to find anything of the sort. It seems that either first-year students are blocked from accessing this information, or the information cannot be found using a terminal. Search all you want, you're not going to find anything. You need to receive permission from your grades advisor before you can access any information about jobs that are available. Oh, okay, that would explain it. Which is unfortunate, I'm curious, but not curious enough to approach her. Her? My grades advisor, Eris Monty. Eh? The girl's face warps in disgust as she hears Eris's name. The first year students are stuck with her? Oh, you poor things! Eros? Oh, my apologies. I shouldn't speak that way about a teacher. Don't worry about it. It's not like I'm going to tell her. Besides, it's clear how she got that nickname. You don't know the half of it. A look of concern appears on the girl's face as she begins to think about Eris. As a boy, you need to be especially careful around that woman. Rumour has it she's been caught sending highly inappropriate messages to students late at night. If she's still working here, then I can only imagine that she's at least been barred from teaching and corresponding with students who have completed their first year here. Okay, is there a reason why she would only be allowed to teach first years? There is, but, um, wait a sec. You were using Terminal a moment ago, weren't you? Ordinarily, I would congratulate you for having accomplished such a feat, but in this case, you might have bitten off a bit more than you can chew. What do you mean? Is this something to do with... Oh. At that moment, everything falls into place. you figured it out, haven't you? Eros has likely been forbidden from interacting with those of us who aren't first-year students, since most of us know how to use Terminal. That being said, if there was only a single first year, particularly a male student, capable of using a terminal then, all of her inappropriate communications would be concentrated on that one student. Exactly. I shudder at the thought of being targeted by Eris. While attractive, her attitude and apparent promiscuity leaves a lot to be desired. Were I to become a sole target of a succubus, I might never sleep through the night again. That's good to know. Wait a second, I already contacted her and she blocked my terminal ID the second I asked her for assistance. Does that mean I'm in the clear? The girl shakes her head. She'll remove the block the moment she starts to become aroused. Oh, I see. If that happens, can't I just block her? You're underestimating the staff at the academy. Eros might be a hopeless pervert, but she's still a top-class mage. If you really want to ward her off, the best thing you can do is respond to her in a troublesome manner. A troublesome manner? Ask her questions about the curriculum at the academy, or finding work. If you respond to her depravity with questions about your studies, she'll lose interest. Seriously. The girl shrugs. He worked for the boys in my grade. Then again, she had many more targets at the time, so she could afford to give up more easily. I suddenly find myself very concerned about the nights I'll be spending at the academy. Succubi are capable of acting human during the day, but come night time, their true selves emerge. Under the light of a full moon in particular, their lust skyrockets, and they become sex-crazed beasts, often portrayed in literature. Okay, thanks for the warning. I'll make sure to take your advice seriously. Oh, don't mention it. Glad to be of assistance. So, um, if you could keep quiet about me eating the books... Eating them? Oh no, I didn't say that. Tearing? I meant tearing. I stare at the girl in amazement as she hurriedly corrects herself. Whatever she's doing in the library, I don't want to know about it. Okay. Whatever you're doing in here, I think it's time to go back to class. I'll see you later. Oh, one more thing before you go. The girl brings up her terminal and shows it to me. This might sound presumptuous of me, but would you care to save my contact details? I mean, you can use terminal after all. 
and I'm sure you're bound to have questions which your classmates cannot yet answer. Though some people, such as teachers and scholars, make their terminal ID and personal information freely available, the same cannot be said about students. For us, the most common way of finding out someone's ID is by asking them in person, and then saving their details on your own terminal. It's inconvenient, but for the sake of preserving one's privacy, it's a small price to pay. Oh, that would be great. Just, let me just, uh, open my terminal as well, and turn the display around, just as the girl in front of me has. Sable Labby is quite an unusual name. It's only at that moment that I realise that neither one of us has asked the other for their name. Wow, I really need to work on my social skills. Okay, I guess I'll find out this girl's name in just a sec anyway. I'll check the girl's terminal screen and search for her name and ID. Joru Gaku? That's my name. Joru replies happily, no doubt smiling from ear to ear behind that mask of hers. Okay, Joru, that makes you the first entry on my contacts list. Or rather, the first terminal ID. Although I have other contacts saved to my terminal, they're mostly the addresses and phone numbers of people incapable of using magic. Seeing as how there are no phones on the academy, however, and mobile phones are strictly forbidden, it's unlikely that I'll ever have a use for them. Yeah, I'm honoured. I've just added you too, Sable, making you number three on mine. That's good to know. I won't be able to respond in the middle of class, but at any other time, feel free to... Wait, you already got two other contacts? Oh yeah, I'm afraid so. Teachers and administrators can be found through a quick search, so it's common for students to not bother adding them to their contacts. The same cannot be said about the contact details of students, however, so it's important to keep a record of those who one might wish to contact. For a third year student to only have two contacts is not a good sign. Well, I'm not going to pry, and it's not like I'm in a position to criticise anyway. Contact me whenever you're free, Jordu. I can't promise that I'll respond immediately, but I'll do my best to be prompt. Oh yeah, me too. If you've got any questions or problems, don't hesitate to rely on me. Waving goodbye to one another, I part from Jodie as I leave the library with more questions than I had when I entered. Between her mask, the matter of her possibly eating books, and her severely limited number of contacts, I leave with a sense that Jodie might be more dangerous than she lets on. Yeah, she seems friendly, but who knows? Back in class, I return to my classroom moments before our second day of the class is supposed to begin. Thankfully, I arrive just before our teacher, and also before Leisha, so nobody present speaks of me arriving just in time. As such, without saying a word or being spoken to, I take my seat and wait patiently for class to begin. Okay. Come on, where's their teacher? All of the students have arrived already, so what's keeping her? No sooner than I griped internally about her teacher's tardiness than Eris appeared at the front of the classroom. Well, I've got the same class of students twice in a row. Screw this. The moment she looks around the room and sees their familiar faces, Eris turns away in disgust. She then creates a bunch of glyphs at the front of the classroom, opens the door, and turns toward us one more time. Your homework is to figure out what these mean. Do it, don't do it, I don't care. Just make sure you stay in here until lesson's over. Given us only those instructions, Eris leaves the classroom as suddenly as she appeared. Wow, unbelievable. I know, right? Why do we get stuck with such an irresponsible teacher? What? Oh yeah, that too. Two? What are you referring to? Nisha points to the glyphs at the front of the classroom. Glyphs, more formally known as runic glyphs, are symbols used by mages all over the world in order to convey messages, curses, and other phenomena based on magic. They're essentially blueprints used in conjunction with an energy source, ether, in order to allow a mage to cast a spell. Within the confines of a classroom, however, glyphs are little more than tools for learning. We students are expected to learn how to read glyphs and to leverage them when we're practicing new spells. They are a study aid, and without them, we would be hopelessly lost. Sable, you can read them, right? Yeah, it's a pretty unusual arrangement, but it isn't difficult to read. Self-study period, correct? Very good. So, you're not a one-trick pony after all. Is that how you see me? Leisha shrugs. I've only seen you cast a single spell after all. I mean, true. But by that logic, as someone who hasn't cast a single spell in my presence, aren't you a hopeless case? Wow, you would dare call your grades valedictorian a hopeless case. This time around it's my turn to shrug. Insolence. Worry not, you'll get your chance soon enough. Our next lesson is out in the courtyard, so I presume we're going to be having a more practical lesson. I think any lesson would be more practical than this. I cast a glance around the room. Nobody is looking at the front of the room, or at the physical terminals on their desks, or even their textbooks. Without a teacher present, they've all descended into their usual behaviour. Wow, I came all the way to Amadronio Academy for this. I was better off studying at home. 
Yeah, our, our fellow students do not want to learn, seems like. But here we go. Once our second class of the day has come to an end, I make my way to the cafeteria for lunch. This break is supposed to last for 45 minutes, so my aim is to eat, walk around campus a bit more, and pray that the food digests before my practical lesson begins. To that effect, I make my way to the counter, look up the menu, and begin to read through the list of unfamiliar dishes. Okay, I know that most of these dishes are supposed to be for Devin humans, but I'm kind of curious to see what they're like. I mean, deep fried goat horn, mammoth tail, dragon tongue. Dragon would never forgive me if I ordered the last one. Wimping out, I decide to order some banana bread. I place my order, move to the side of the counter, and wait for my meal. Best not to eat something exotic before a practical lesson. I wouldn't want to get an upset stomach and throw up in the middle of chanting a spell. Moments after I've placed my order, I'm presented with a few thick slices of banana bread. Since the loaf has already been baked, there's no need to wait, and I'm able to walk off in search of a free seat almost immediately. The second I find one, however... Oh, it's Ray! Sable, my good friend! No. Sable. nuh -uh. My dear Sable! I'm not giving you any. Friend. Stop it. Without even taking a seat, I wolf down my lunch at an unhealthy speed before my hungry companions can take it from me. Damn, cheapskate. Selfish. Oh, shut up. You're the ones trying to steal my lunch. If you're that hungry, go and order something. I did, but apparently Mammoth Tail takes at least half an hour to cook all the way through. You ordered Mammoth Tail? What about you? Did you order something more normal? Um, unholy water. What? Just water? Ignoring the first word out of S mouth, I sigh in relief. I guess she is a plant after all, at least partially. Your meal should be ready soon then, Eth. Well, if it's just water, you don't even need to pay for it, right? Eth shakes her head. The Dark Priest won't arrive for another hour. So just make do with regular? I refuse. I sigh and rub the back of my head. Why can't these two order something less troublesome? Shaking off my amazement, I decide to change the subject. So, how's class? Having fun? Yeah. Don't even joke about that, Sable. We've only had two classes today, and I'm already about to collapse. That bad. S nods. It's boring. There's too many words. Exactly. Our teacher just won't shut up. Every single sentence out of her mouth is magic, this, and ether, that. Can't you give us a break? It's too much. Yeah. Just what kind of institution did you think this is? Rather than lecture the two unwilling students, I breathe a sigh of exasperation. Well, at least your teacher's trying to do the job. Mine just had us watch a lecture for our first class. She barely even showed up to the second. Wow, I'm jealous. I'm so jealous. Yeah, yeah, of course they are. Hey, Sable, do you want to swap classes? Yeah, me too. Believe me, there's nothing I'd like more than to join a class with a teacher who actually does her job. Unfortunately, I'm pretty sure students don't have any say in the matter. Just say that the teacher sexually harassed you. It worked for one of the students at my school. Wow, seriously? Yeah, she told the principal. Before I knew it, we had a brand new teacher. Come to think of it, I never did see our previous teacher again after that. I don't have the heart to tell Ray that her friend likely destroyed that poor teacher's career, if not their entire life. Yeah, yeah, I don't think I'm going to be doing that. If this continues, I'll just start borrowing books from the library and bring them to class. What? The library? Nerd. Excuse me for taking my studies seriously. Honestly, you're the last people I want to hear talking down the importance of studying. I've seen how poorly the two of you ranked on the entrance exams. That, that was just a bad day for me? I was, like, sick. Yeah, me too. You're both terrible liars. Anyway, getting back to the topic. If you're hungry enough to steal, why not order something cheap and filling? You mean like banana bread? Exactly. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to spoil my appetite before my mammoth tail's ready. You were perfectly willing to do so a moment ago when it was my food. Yeah, that's different. How is it different? I feel my blood pressure climb as Ray's warped view of the world continues to roll me up. Forget it. Have fun waiting on your need to see extravagant food. I'm going to go walk around for a bit before my next class. What? Don't go. Stay. No can do. I've got a practical lesson next, so sitting around here talking is out of the question. See ya. I see, we ditched them. Without waiting for my companions to reply, I'll, oh no you don't. Stay. What? What's this? Before I can escape, Ray and Eth cut me off. What is going on with you two? Look, I'll come back after I walk around for a bit, okay? So just let me be on my way. Ray narrows her eyes. You're going to run away again. I'm, I'm not. Liar. How unreliable are you? If that's how you're going to be, then... A smirk appears on Ray's face. 
Whatever she's about to say. I've got a feeling I'm not going to like it. What is she going to do? Oh, so this is Sable's room. It's big. I mean, I keep telling you, there's nothing special about it. It's the same size and configuration as every other room here. Oh, I mean, I guess it is. Not mine. Really? Hmm, my room's small, with a big window. There's also a heating lamp, and the floor's made out of stone. I'll try to picture S bedroom. Going by her description, it sounds like she's in a mix between a greenhouse and an incubation chamber. Is S perhaps the first Mandragora to enroll here? That sounds, um, nice. Yeah, it's warm and bright. What? No fair. Why does S get a special room and I don't? Do you even want to live in a room like that? I mean, not really. I just don't like that she's getting preferential treatment, that's all. I stare at Ray with a mix of disbelief and exasperation. Is she really going to complain about being treated like a human instead of a plant? Sighing, I shake my head. Anyway, now that you see my room, get out. If exercise is out of the question, then I'd at least like to revise some of the course content before the next lesson. Already? Yeah, why do we have to leave already? Oh, I get it. You're about to change into something easier to move around in for your next lesson, and you're too embarrassed to undress in front of us. Are you really that ashamed of your body? Ray snickers and glances down at my crotch. I strongly advise you to never say or do that again. Many a domestic struggle has started like that, and it never ends well. Oh, come on, just get on with it already, right, Eth? I'm hungry. Exactly. Hurry up, so we can go back to the cafeteria and eat. I sigh and hang my head. I'm not getting changed, and I'm sure as hell not undressing in front of you. Why not, are you too embarrassed? Come on, it's not like you lose anything by being seen. Apart from my patience. Why do you want to see me undressed anyway? Are you some kind of perv? I just want to see how cool you look in your sports gear, that's all. Yeah, I don't believe you. Just use your imagination. You've both seen the Academy issue sportswear, haven't you? Yeah. Ray needs a moment to think about the question, whereas Eth simply shakes her head. Really? Mm, I'm exempt from these classes. Oh, I see. I guess it would be kind of pointless for you to take part in anything physically demanding. But what about magic application lessons? Those can get pretty rigorous, I hear. Yes, yeah, fine. I don't sweat. Oh. My eyes widen as I mull over Eth's response. If I think of Eth as a plant rather than a person, then it all makes a lot more sense. After all, plants don't need to exercise like we do, nor do they possess sweat glands. But if Eth really is more plant than human, then what's with her diet? Is she a carnivorous plant, like a Venus flytrap, or is she something completely different altogether? With yet another item added to my research list, I head toward the door. Okay, that's enough. Let's head back to the cafe. Wait, where's Ray gone? Eth and I both look around the room, searching for Ray. After a few moments, I spy her near the bed, rummaging through a suitcase. My roommate's suitcase, that is. Sable, I knew you were kind of odd, but, um... Ray pinches her fingers and raises her hand. Between her thumb and index finger are a pan of teeny tiny panties, small enough to fit on a doll. What the hell? Put those back. Sable plays with dolls. No, they're not mine. Oh really? Then whose are they? My roommates. Without uttering a word, Ray looks at the fabric clenched between her fingers once more. She then looks to her side, finally seeming to realise that there are two beds in the room and not one. Your, your roommate? Yeah, she's a pixie. Immediately comprehending my statement, Ray hurriedly puts the underwear back to where she found it. She pats down the suitcase and tries to put everything back the way it was. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, tell that to my roommate when she starts yelling at me for going through her stuff. Oh. Ray lets out a faint whimper as she realises the mistake that she's made. It's one thing to go through the belongings of a friend while they're right next to you, but to do so in absent stranger is going way too far. Okay, well, what's done is done, I guess. Let's just go back to the cafeteria so you two can wait for your orders. Yeah, okay. I'm worried. Are we going to get our arm broken again or something? After spending a sombre 30 minutes or so with Eth, whose unholy water fails to arrive, and Ray, who feels guilty about her earlier actions, I head to the courtyard for my next class. Unlike during our first two classes, this time around Leisha is the first to arrive, having no doubt remained in the courtyard since the moment our previous class ended. Situated off to the side, she waits on her own as our classmates begin to show up, eager to separate herself from the pack. The moment I begin to walk toward her, it's your sable! I'm assaulted from behind by an ear-spitting shout. Oh man, you wouldn't believe the morning I had. My teacher is some kind of psychotic old man, and there's this aggro little fairy in my class, and this one muscle-bound dude, and uh... Whoa, calm down, get a hold of yourself. I forcibly push Draken away as she tries to cling to me. 
despite having met one another for the first time earlier today, and only for a very brief period at that. It's clear that she already considers us good friends. A dragon? Sable, you're friends with a dragon. Half dragon. Pay no mind to the fear and a surprise in Leisha's voice. Dragon's expression immediately brightens and she smiles at the wary elf happily. Hey, I'm Dragon. Are you a friend of Sable's? Oh, um, I don't know if I'd go that far. So you're not friends? I didn't say that. Then, then which is it? Either you're friends or you're not. It's kind of simple, really. Still smiling cheerfully, Dragon's friendly and straightforward personality quickly overwhelms Leisha. Leisha, seemingly wary of both Dragon and the question itself, falters. I mean, I suppose some might consider us to be friends. However, Leisha glances at me, as though waiting for me to finish her sentence, perhaps afraid to assume too much of our relationship. Leisha is the polar opposite of Dragon when it comes to making friends. Is she truly that unsociable, or is Leisha just mindful that having a few classes together isn't enough to form a friendship? Paying the matter far less thought than the sulking elf to my right, and much more thought than the energetic dragon to my left, I answer on Leisha's behalf. What are you saying, Leisha? Of course we're friends. Um, we are? I mean, yeah, of course we are. Thick as thieves, you and I. Comrades in the pursuit of knowledge, greater than the possessed by any before us. Okay, yeah, that's what I meant. Whatever you two are to one another, right now, we're all in the same situation. So let's do our best and help each other out, okay? Help each other out? Come on, Sable, the lesson? The dragon's words, I come to an obvious realisation far too late. Dragon isn't here to ditch class and hang out with us. Her classmates are also here, and so's her teacher. This is a joint lesson. Wow, assist one another if you must, but I for one shall require no such consideration. I happen to be an expert in magic of all varieties, particularly those used in combat. Oh wow, so the elf knows how to fight. We should spar sometime. My mama always told me that elves put up a good fight when you're incinerating their homeland. Oh. Leisha immediately regrets her words. Though Dragon fails to understand her reaction, it's crystal clear that Leisha has remembered the true nature of the human creature before her. Dragons and elves are natural enemies. The former have wiped out countless clans of the latter, slaughtering them all indiscriminately. I wouldn't blame Leisha if she wanted nothing to do with the naive girl beside her. So, um, joint lessons, right? Wow, I can't wait. This is going to be exciting. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. If nothing else, at least we'll have a real teacher for once. I'm not going to get your hopes up. What? Leisha follows my gaze as I set my eyes on the man who I presume to be Dragon's teacher. Slowly approaching the class is an aging man, easily 70 or so years of age. He has a walking stick in his right hand and a wooden sword over his left shoulder. Though he appears to have some fight left in him, the old man is clearly no longer in his prime. It would be a different matter if he were a dragon, but man, you humans age poorly. Indeed, were he an elf, he'd still be as agile as he was in his teen years, if not more so. Rub it in my face, why don't you? Unfortunately for me, humans age rather quickly compared to most demi-human races. Elves, for example, are known to live for hundreds of years, and dragons count centuries like humans count days. While some races, such as pixies and harpies, tend to live shorter lives than humans, the majority of prominent demi-human races outlast us by many lifetimes. Oh, there you are. Welcome, my beloved students, to Glyph Invoking Class, or, as the more formal name goes, Runic Typography Studies. I trust that you're all getting along with our friends in Class 1D. Yes, ma'am. Alright, glad to hear it. Now that almost everyone's here, it's time for you to all start pairing up with other students. Pick a student from the other class and then stand next to your partner and face the front. Once everybody's partnered up, further instructions will be given. I stare at Eris skeptically as her bright smile and cheerful tone of voice fill me with doubt. Last lesson she barely even showed up to class, now she's as bright and chipper as can be. Is she just acting this way because another teacher's present? Or is Miss Monty actually a good teacher at heart? The moment I remember my conversation with Julia in the library though, I conclude that it must be the former. Whatever the case, if she's willing to teach, I'm willing to learn. The only question is, who do I pair up with? Dragon would be the obvious choice, but she's by no means my only option. Despite being in a panic when we met up, Dragon clearly stated that there was an aggro little fairy in her class. Assuming that she was aggro precisely because Dragon called her a fairy, I figure there's a good chance that she was talking about ticks. And it's not like I need to pair up with either one of them. There's an entire class of students here, any of whom would be likely be less troublesome. Or they could be worse. For all I know, Dragon and Tix might be the most serious students in their class. Honestly, I think the likelihood of that being true is rather low, but you never know. Okay, so Leisha is not an option. I think we'll go with Dragon. 
I'll sign resignation and glance toward Dragon, who's already staring at me expectantly. Okay, screw it. Maybe she'll surprise me and take class serious. She did rank quite highly in the entrance exam, after all, and it's not like I can judge her ability based on her personality. I at least owe her a chance. Say, um, Dragon, what are you waiting for? Get over here already. Grinning from ear to ear, Dragon invites me over to her side. With my partner selected, I wait for the remaining students to pair up. Once everyone has found a partner, our teachers straighten up and stare at us seriously, preparing to begin the lesson at any moment. They stand side by side, just like many of us, and begin to concentrate ether around their hands. Okay, now that everyone's paired up, allow me to explain the essence of runic typography studies. This class is designed to teach you to write and memorise a variety of glyphs. You will write them in the air, leaving a trail of ether dust to spell out words in runic writing, and then invoke whatever spell you have cast with as little power as you possibly can. By experimenting with different words, you will naturally begin to associate certain glyphs with certain elements, or different effects. At the same time, you will decrease your casting time through repeated practice of the basics. This is the class with a wide variety of applications, so I implore you all to take it seriously. Ether dust, runic writing, glyphs. As I look around, I see a number of students who seem puzzled by these unfamiliar terms. They have no doubt heard the words in passing or read them in textbooks, but that's not enough to prepare them for what our teachers have planned. I almost pity my classmates being thrown in head first like this. Luckily for them, what Eris instructed us to do isn't actually that difficult. Create a few random glyphs, attempt to invoke them, and then curse your failure and try again. In other words, experiment with the basics of spellcasting until you've gained sufficient confidence. Okay, let's get this show on the road. Glyphs are a piece of cake for us dragons. They are? I would have thought that dragons would have no need to write glyphs. You're sorely mistaken, my dear friend. Where do you think humans learned most of these symbols? They certainly didn't figure it out themselves. Oh. I stare at Dragon wide-eyed as she nonchalantly reveals to me information which symbolists have been chasing for centuries. Come to think of it, Dragon's mother could easily be many thousands of years of age. It makes sense that she would have a lot of knowledge to impart upon her child. Dragon might be far more knowledgeable than I assumed. Okay, if you've never engaged in the process of creating glyphs before, please ask your partner to show you how. If neither one of you knows, or you need further instruction, ask your respective teachers and we'll show you how it's done. For those who are already confident in their abilities, I ask that you refrain from showing off. Focus on retaining absolute control, rather than engaging in reckless behaviour. Every year, we have many students injured during this class, and even a few fatalities. So when I tell you to stop, or to control yourself, make sure you listen. If you go too far, we're going to stop you by force. Eris issues a stern warning to the more whimsical and prideful among us. I look around at my fellow students. In doing so, I understand why Eris is warning us right before the very beginning. Indeed, the risk of injury is bound to be high when gathering novice mages and having them all practice unfamiliar spells. I can't fault Eris for a caution. Even so, to think that people have actually died in this class before. Right then, without further ado, you may begin. Take turns with your partner and watch them carefully, point out any mistakes they make, and learn from what they do correctly. Also, remember that we're going to be watching, so no fighting. Just take things at your own pace and don't push your limits. You are here to practice runic writing, not to cast powerful spells. Eris' instructions are concluded, and the students in either class turn to one another once more. It's finally time to get started. Okay, buddy, stand back and watch how it's done. Well, you're going to go first? Don't overdo it, you heard teach. Yeah, nobody ever got anywhere listening to teachers telling them what they can't do. Now strap yourself in, get ready for a show. I take a few steps back as a precaution while my partner gets ready to begin. Whether my partner is in complete control or not, I'm not about to risk getting hurt or by getting too close. Here she comes. The moment I step back, it begins. My partner starts to gather ether within her body and immediately radiates energy so strong that it sends shivers down my spine. Despite being told by a teacher to tone it down, it appears that she has no intention of doing so. Either that, or she lacks the precision I had assumed on her behalf. O eternal mother of flames, I beseech thee, bestow upon me but a fraction of your power. Bathe me in the flames of life, and burn to ashes all who gaze upon me with ill intent. Dragon trance a spell I've never heard before. Whether she learned it from her mother, an old tome, or just created the spell itself, the power radiating from her body tells me just how dangerous it is. If her control is poor, this might end really badly for everyone here. Averting my gaze, I briefly glance over to other pairs of students around the courtyard. Although most of them are using very basic spells, my partner is by no means the only one putting on an impressive display. It seems that my grade is filled with skilled mages spanning across many different races. 
Amazing to think that there are students in my grade capable of magic like this. I thought that my in-depth understanding of magic put me at an advantage over my classmates, but apparently this isn't the case. I might possess impressive knowledge, but these students are clearly leagues above me in other areas. As is the case with any skill, simply being knowledgeable about magic is not enough to become a master. The practical application of high-level magic requires years of training and hard work, not to mention natural talent. It isn't something you can just use freely just by knowing how it works. Seeing my classmates use techniques which I myself cannot reminds me of this. What do you think? Are you in awe of my mighty flames? Dragon smirks and glances toward me. Despite the sheer output of her spell, Dragon is able to converse with me without breaking her concentration. This girl is far more skilled than I thought. Amazing, she's truly amazing. I can't believe you're able to pull off something like that so easily. Flames continue to swirl around Dragon's body, and she smiles proudly. Then before they can expand any further, Dragon inhales deeply, sucking the flames into her body. In an instant, the flames are gone. Dragon then sighs, exhaling breath so hot that it could melt iron, and the last remnants of her spell disappear. Wow, nothing like a little fire play to get the blood pumping. I probably shouldn't have eaten the flames though, now I feel kinda sick. Surprisingly, Dragon seems to regret showing off. Her expression sours, and there's clear discomfort on her face. If you're feeling unwell, maybe you should speak to the teachers. I know where the infirmary is, I can escort you there if you want. Nah, it's fine. Thanks for your consideration, but I'll be fine in a minute. Just a little bit of heartburn, you know? I raise an eyebrow, a dragon's literal take on the term heartburn, and breathe a sigh of relief. Oh well, if she says it's okay, I'm going to take her word for it. Besides, I didn't really want to miss out on such an important class on my first day. With my partner's display still fresh in my mind, I step back, take a deep breath, and begin to prepare myself for my turn. Before gathering ether, or drawing any glyphs, or invoking any chance, it's imperative that I decide what kind of spell I should use. What would be safe to use around so many people? What would impress my partner? What can I use without causing a disturbance? Many questions swirl around inside my head, and before long, I've got my answer. I gather ether in my palms, and stand up straight. With my eyes wide open, and ample fuel at my disposal, I begin to chant. Everlasting darkness, I permit thee to reside within this lowly vessel. Instill in me the coldness of death, and warp my being with unyielding force. Against my better judgement, I decide to show off by chanting a spell that I created myself. The chant is ominous, as it's its intended use. It's a technique I have to be careful with, and honestly, a poor choice for a simple demonstration. Through the eye of the abyss, your power becomes mine. I take in my hand that which belongs to no man and make it my own. Depress and contort under the weight of all, know no escape from my grasp and perish at my touch. Your fate is now mine to command. Having second thoughts at the last moment, I swallow my reservation and push ahead. It's already too late to cancel the invocation. What's important now is that I remain in control. Why, what the hell's this? It looks pretty, but I get the feeling I shouldn't touch. I ignore my partner's murmurs, not because I don't want to answer her, but because I can't spare the attention. If I lose focus for even a moment, I'm going to fail. Okay, that's the hard bit done. Now I just need to maintain the cluster in this state for a minute, and then dispel. With my hands and arms curved in front of me, as though I'm holding an invisible basketball, I gaze down at the growing black sphere. Suspended in mid-air is a mass of energy, frightfully dense and far too dangerous to touch. Anything consumed by the sphere will be compressed and flattened without mercy. Everything inside it will join together, forced to become a single object. This is gravity manipulation magic. Okay, I'm halfway. Just a little longer, and I'll be able to dispel it safely. Okay, I wanna touch it. I wanna touch it so bad, but... My eyes open wide as Dragon reaches out toward me. Her hand approaches the sphere, which is being maintained between my arms as she continues to stare, completely fixated. Dragon don't. Dedicating myself to controlling the spell, I'm barely able to warn my partner while still maintaining the sphere's form. Unfortunately, I'm too late. My concentration is broken and my partner is too close to me to safely restore the sphere to its intended size. At this stage, I can't ride this invocation out and dispel it. If I'm going to avoid injuring myself and my partner, I'll need to cast this spell over a wide area and minimise its effect as much as possible. Damn it. I'm sorry, everyone. Oh. What's going on? The hell's this? My body, I can't move. The cries of my classmates reach my ears as I dedicate my entire being to minimising the effects of my own spell. 
I spread out the area of the effect as widely as I can, simultaneously strengthening the spell in empty space not being occupied by anybody else. However, I soon reach my limit. The ether inside my body is quickly depleted and I can no longer control the spell I've cast. I desperately absorb the ether in the air around me. I try to regain even a sliver to control to undo just a small amount of the damage I've caused. But it's no use. I've already exhausted my energy to the point where I can no longer stand. I was far too reckless. Oh wow. Okay, so we'll leave it here. This is Usho signing off and hopefully I will see you next time and hopefully no one's died.